Okay, I think we're about ready to begin. Uh, are there any questions from last time? All right, well, let me maybe begin by reviewing uh, a little bit of, of what we've been working on. Uh, so we've introduced hyperbolic uh, metric spaces. Uh, specifically, we're looking at uh, graph spaces and and uh, and we said they're hyperbolic if they have this condition where is it? it's been a little while since we've been working on this uh, so there were two ways to define it one is that we defined it by uh, triangles are all uh, very thin in the sense that any two sides uh, the epsilon neighborhood of any two sides covers the third side uh, or another way we saw it is that by we could consider this Gromov product, uh, yzx, which gave us the length in the court and the comparison tripod. The Gromov project product gives us this length here, uh, and we could define hyperbolic uh, geometry as if you had two points in the triangle which got sent to the same point in the comparison tripod, then their distance had to be a most delta, uh, and we want this for all triangles. Okay, and then we started, uh, so this was our definition of a, of a uh, hyperbolic uh, um, graph. And then, uh, yeah, so we showed that they're the same. Uh, and then last time we introduced quasi-isometric embeddings, and we introduced the notion of a quasi-geodesic, um, and we showed that hyperbolic graphs have the nice property that quasi-geodesics are not too far away from genuine geodesics. Uh, specifically, we, we proved uh, this theorem somewhere, this theorem right here, that if there's some, um, if you have a hyperbolic graph and you have a C and an R, then there's some D, which only depends on C, R, and delta, such that any C, R quasi-geodesic uh, is not too far away D and Hausdorff distance from a genuine geodesic. And in particular, all genuine geodesics are within D Hausdorff distance of each other. Uh, and now we were going to prove a next step, uh, which is the following. Uh, so we introduced an equivalence relation on infinite rays. So we said that uh, two rays were equivalent if the uh, limit as n and m tend to infinity of the Gromov product is always infinite, given with that whenever, whatever starting point we start with. Uh, so this was the definition of when two graphs are, two geodesics. So these are infinite geodesics, and this was the definition of when they're, um, when they're equivalent. And then we saw uh, we were going to prove this lemma to actually prove that it's an equivalence relation. And that is that two infinite geodesics are equivalent if and only if uh, whenever we take uh, their uh, soup over m of the distance between the mth point of one path and the one path and the other, then this was finite. And the nice thing about this is this is obviously an equivalence relation. So if we, once we show it's the same as this, then we see that in particular, this equivalence of infinite geodesics is, does give an equivalence relation. And then we define the Gromov boundary as the space of equivalence classes here. I have one quick question. Yeah. Uh, that, that constant D that depend on the, on the C and the R, how does it depend on C? Like if C and R are oh, I don't know, I bigger or smaller, smaller, does D become smaller or bigger? Well, of course, uh, if you, so uh, C and R were the, the constants saying how, you know, coarse of a relationship our, our quasi isometry could become. So naturally, if you increase C and increase R, then D is going to increase also. You're going to have to, you know, um, but the exact relationship, uh, if it's linear, I don't know, you'll have to fish out from the proof. Uh, so the proof gives that we have this relationship between the supremum of D and all the other terms. And so you can just get a relationship out of that. Yeah. Okay. So it's there, but you have to search for it, I guess. 
Uh, okay, so let's then go ahead and uh, prove this lemma that I stated last time. Uh, maybe it'll help if I copy it over. Okay, so here's the lemma, which like I said, just states that, um, yeah, so maybe we can draw the picture here as well. Uh, so we have here some alpha, which is gonna be some path. It's gonna look like this, so this is my alpha. We have some path uh, beta, which you know, may, maybe looks like this, beta. And here's alpha naught, here's beta naught. And we have some distance. So we have some geodesic triangle here and the distance here is, uh, right, this is distance from alpha naught. And so what are we saying? We're saying that if we take any M which is greater than this distance, so that's gonna be some, gonna give us some points here so that this distance is M. Then as soon as we take any two points beyond this, we take a point here, we take, uh, uh, so for any, whenever we take some point, and they're always existed by, if one is just, yeah. So if we take some point beyond this, some point on alpha that's beyond it, then there's gonna be always some other point on beta, which is not so far away from it in this sense. All right, so this is the picture. So let's go ahead and now prove the lemma. So here's proof of the lemma. So let's go ahead and fix uh, m greater than or equal to the distance between alpha naught and beta naught. And let's go ahead and set the origin O to be alpha naught. Right, so this is my origin right here. All right, so what are we assuming? We're assuming that they're equivalent geodesics. So this means that at some point on, their Gromov product uh, with respect to O will always be larger. So we'll go ahead and find some M1 and N1 natural numbers such that uh, the Gromov product alpha M1 and beta N1 with respect to this origin O is greater than M. All right, so we're just going to pick uh, some you know, numbers here. Maybe it's right here and right here. So this is gonna be some beta N1, and this is gonna be some alpha N1, something like that. Uh, and now what we're going to do is we're going to choose a geodesic we want to draw some triangles here. So we're going to choose a geodesic from the origin to beta N1. All right, so maybe I'll try to use a different color for that. Uh, so we have, so I'm going to choose some geodesic. Here. So this is the geodesic zero to beta N1. All right, so now uh, uh, what we're going to do is we'll take x on this geodesic from 0 to beta n1 such that the distance from the origin to x is the same as the distance from the origin to alpha n. So here we have, so uh, M1 is, yeah, so we have alpha M. So we have this distance here is M is greater than this. So alpha M is somewhere like this, alpha M. And then we're choosing X somewhere like this, right on this segment. Uh, and then what do we have? So notice that, uh, you yeah. So alpha M, M1 and N1 should be larger than M. Uh, so 
so what's the point here is now we have a triangle here. If we look at um, this triangle, which has the origin and beta N1 and alpha M1, then we get that these two points, uh, alpha M and X, uh, are both distance, uh, the same distance from the origin. But on the other hand, we chose this, these points in such a way such that the Gromov product is larger than M. Uh, so what this means is that in the comparison triangle, so this triangle we, we chose very, very stretched out. So that in the comparison triangle, when we look at alpha naught, it's going to be very stretched out. And then we're going to have maybe some alpha M1 and then maybe some beta and one over here. So this is what the comparison triangle is going to look like. And we know that this length right here, this length is uh, at least n, so greater than or equal to n, which means that uh, in the comparison triangle, the, the x here is going to be mapped to this side of the tripod of the triple point, which means that the alpha of m will be mapped to the same thing. Right, so therefore we can use the fact that triangles are delta thin. So because why why does the the x get mapped into this red point of this? Uh, just because the distance from x to the origin is less than m. Um, and why is that? Uh, because we took it so that it's the distance the same as the distance from the origin to alpha m, which of course is equal to m. So I guess it's equal to n, but this is, oh, okay. uh, yeah. but this is greater than n. So I should say this is not, this is greater than n. And this distance right here is equal to n. And this is where x, x and alpha m get mapped to this point. Right, so X and alpha M get mapped to the same point in the comparison tripod for this. And because triangles are delta thin, uh, we then have that the distance between X and alpha M is at most delta. We have that the distance between X and alpha M is less than delta. All right. Uh, but now, what can we do? Now we'll do the same thing, but now we'll kind of patch it down to here. So we'll get down to here. So specifically, is we now let uh, or take n. So this would be less than n1, uh, such that the distance from x to beta n1 is equal to the distance uh, from beta n to beta n1. Uh, Uh, and why does this exist? This exists because the, um, the distance from X to the origin here, we know is greater than M or is equal to M and M is greater than this distance. So we have that this distance right here is certainly greater than this distance. And that means that this distance uh, right here is going to be less than this distance. So by the triangle inequality. So there means that at some point along this path here, there's going to be some point where the distances are the same. Uh, okay, so then what can we say there? Uh, now I want to claim a similar argument. Um, so let me see.
Yeah, so what do we have? Uh, so the triangles I'm going to do this time, the triangle I'm going to compare it to is this triangle A naught to B naught. Uh, hold on. No, it's just this whole triangle. A, A naught to beta N1 and this, this triangle right here. Right, and so the point is, is that this distance here is M, but we know that uh, this distance is M uh, is less, less, sorry, this distance is less than M. So we know that this can't be mapped, this gets mapped to this section. It can't go all the way to the, to the point X. So therefore we know that this map, these two points get mapped to the same point in the comparison triangle tri tripod for that. So specifically here, now we have alpha naught, we have here, uh, beta naught, and we have here beta n1. And we have some comparison tripod here, something like this. And what do we know? We know that x and, uh, and beta n both get mapped to the same point on this, right? They're both on this leg of the comparison tripod. So again, we get that the distance between X and beta N has to be no more than delta. So again, we have the distance between X and beta N is less than delta. But now just by the triangle inequality, we say we see that therefore the distance from alpha M to uh, beta N is less than two delta. And what else do I claim about the theorem? And if you compute, what is this uh, n minus m in absolute value? Well, what did we take? Uh, how do we choose n? We chose n such that its distance. Uh, hold on. So we chose N. So the claim is that this is indeed less than or equal to the distance between alpha naught and beta naught. Uh, oh, and that's of course obvious if you look at it in the comparison triangle because here, uh, hold on. Uh, then uh, let's see, we took alpha M here. No, this should be obvious somehow, but Uh, yeah, okay, now I've confused myself. This should just be a triangle uh, argument. Um, hold on, let me think. So that's because here we have the distance from, uh, 
So the distance from beta zero to beta n is this distance. Uh, so that's just n. And this distance is m. And the, the difference should be of these should be less than no more than this. Uh, Can we add delta? Or well, two delta is fine. Okay. Uh, two delta is fine. And we can also uh, find if we add delta because we can think of x and beta n. Uh, okay, yeah. So here we have, yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay, so we have this plus two delta. So then just the triangle inequality there should give us that certainly this is less than this plus two delta uh, is what you're saying. So we certainly get, get this, uh, which is fine for our purposes, but uh, okay. So let me just leave it like that then. I'll change this to plus two delta. Uh, but uh, this should be straightforward. Somehow when I prepared my notes, it seemed obvious and so. Um, but of course, yeah, that's a good point. That's, that's all we need right there. Uh, okay, so anyway, that, uh, that certainly shows that we have this supremum finite, uh, which is what we wanted to show. Uh, maybe we should also show the converse, that is that if the supremum of the distances here is finite, uh, then why is it that the uh, geodesics are equivalent? So let's do that. So conversely, so if the soup over M of the Grimaud product Alpha M, Beta M, O, uh, uh, wait, hold on. Okay, so, so sorry, certainly it's a soup over M of the distance between Alpha M and Beta M is finite, then I claim that the paths are equivalent. Uh, so, uh, how can we see that? That's just going to be a computation because we just compute uh, alpha m uh, beta n. Well, so certainly, uh, so certainly this implies that the Hausdorff distance between alpha and beta is finite. Um, and so it's bounded by whatever this number is. Uh, and so we can show that uh, then what can we say? Well, we can say that, um, so if we, uh, let's just go ahead and compute two alpha m beta n with O. And then we'll just plug in the formula for this. So this is distance from alpha m to O plus distance from beta n to O minus the distance from alpha m to beta n. Uh, and then this, well, we will just replace um, O with alpha M and use triangle inequality. So this is greater than or equal to, uh, so the distance from alpha M to alpha O, so that's just M or alpha M to alpha naught, that's just M and then minus the distance from alpha naught to O. And we'll do the same replacement with this term. So this is plus N minus the distance from beta naught to O. And then for this term, we'll just replace by, um, by any uh, M. So this is, we'll replace, uh, you know, uh, let's assume maybe that M is less than N or something like that. In which case we can replace this by um, uh, 
yeah, we'll use the triangle inequality and go from beta n to beta m. So this is then uh, minus, and now we have uh, m minus n plus the distance from alpha m to beta. Uh, this is, I guess I switched it, so n, n less than n. Okay, uh, and then what can we see here? So the m's cancel out, so we get uh, greater than or equal to 2n, uh, and then we have minus the distance from alpha naught to the origin plus the distance from beta naught to the origin, which are both fixed. And then here, uh, this we have um, uh, this condition here. So this is uh, this is less than or equal to the house start distance. So the negative of it is greater than or equal to the house start distance. Right, and now we see all of these are fixed. And then as n goes to infinity, uh, this goes to infinity. So this goes to infinity as n or m go to infinity. Since we just required that uh, m was larger than n. Okay, so that uh, gives the other, the other direction. So that finishes. All right, so now I said, uh, as I said, we can define the Gromov boundary. of this graph is the set of equivalence classes. Of infinite geodesics. And now we want to put a topology on this space. So that's the next thing I want to do. So let me define what is going to be the open sets or the open or rather neighborhoods. So we'll fix a base point O. This is in the graph. And then uh, for Z in the boundary, so for some equivalence class of infinite geodesics, and for R greater than zero, we're going to set U Z R. This is going to be the set of X in gamma closure. So I'm also going to define the compactive, well, gamma closure is just going to be gamma union the boundary. And I'll set U Z R. So this will be the set of X in gamma bar such that uh, there exists geodesics alpha and beta uh, with um, alpha plus to be x, beta plus to be z, and maybe that's more terminology I'll introduce here. So if a geodesic represents uh, some, some point Z in this. So if a geodesic alpha, so then write alpha plus is equal to Z. So we'll think of these geodesics as in some sense converging as geodesics from some point to this boundary point here. This is how we think of this, this is the notation. And then I'll also think of points in the space themselves. They'll just be singleton geodesics. Um, so or if you want to think of them as infinite geodesics, well, um, I mean, they'll be you know, finite, sorry. So these will all be uh, paths from the origin. But uh, if x is in the graph gamma, they'll be a finite geodesics. Right? So these are finites or infinite geodesics. 
So there exists g at s6 alpha and beta with alpha x, alpha plus alpha mapping to x, uh, beta tending to z, uh, and the lemminth as m and n tend to infinity of the Gromov product, alpha m beta n should be greater than r. All right, so what's the, I mean, we saw that as this tends to infinity, uh, if they're equivalent, if the Gromov product tends to infinity, so in some sense, it if the Gromov product is very large, then it says that these geodesics point near the same direction or they, they take a long time to diverge direction. This is roughly the idea. Uh, and then we'll also, so this was if there exists a geodesic, and we'll also set u prime zr. This is the set of all x in uh, gamma bar such that for every geodesic, for all, it's the same definition, but we just require for all geodesics alpha and beta plus alpha plus for x, beta plus e plus z, and limit to infinity, alpha n, beta n, greater than r. So it's the same thing. Uh, and then we'll, so of course, obviously, uh, u prime is contained in u. And we'll prove uh, that the converse happens up to some uh, epsilon. So specifically, let's prove the next lemma. That is that uh, there exists c greater than 0, which is only, only going to depend on the uh, hyperbolicity constants such that if alpha and alpha prime and beta and beta prime are geodesics with alpha plus, same thing as alpha prime plus and beta plus equal to beta prime plus. So then we have that the limit as n and m tend to infinity of alpha prime m beta prime m o is greater than or equal to the limit as n and m tend to infinity of alpha m beta m o minus c. So by just shifting by some fixed constant c, uh, then uh, we get in particular, right? So you have the u prime of zr is contained in u of zr. So that's trivial. But by this lemma, we're only we're going to get the uh, reverse equality c prime of c r minus c, right? Where c is just some thing that's independent uh, only depends on the uh, hyperbolicity constant. Uh, and this, this is easy enough to do. So here's the proof of this fact. Let's just go ahead and compute alpha prime, m prime, beta prime, n prime. And this is um, uh, yeah, if you just plug in the definition of the Gromov product, then we can see that this is greater than or equal to alpha m, and we'll use triangle inequality, minus the terms that are left over, or the distance between alpha prime, m prime, alpha m, plus the distance between beta prime, m prime, beta n. Uh, but then we're supposing that these 
represent the same uh, geodesics. And so by the previous lemma, we saw that this was bounded uh, by some uh, whatever constant we came up with the previous. So this, uh, yeah, for this specific constant. Uh, Uh, right, so there exists this constant C, right? So it's the same constant C, in fact. So this will, I guess, maybe twice C, because here we're doing it twice. So this is greater than or equal to um, minus uh, two C, where C was, where C is from the previous level. Okay, so that proves proves this. Uh, so, if we, yeah. All right, so the next thing I need to see, so this will really tell us that we have a topology. So this is the next lemma that we need. And that is that for all R great, greater than zero, there exists S greater than zero, such that uh, if Y and Z are in the boundary with Y in this neighborhood of Z. Uh, so then the whole neighborhood of Y is contained in the entire neighborhood. Okay, so this is the next thing we want to prove. Uh, now I'll remark by the previous lemma, we know that U is contained in some u prime, uh, so it's enough just to show this for uh, uh, u prime. So that's one one thing that will help. Uh, so yeah, and then Uh, yeah, so specifically what we're going to show, so the proof suffices to show that if y is in u prime z of some n and x is in u prime, Y n. So then um, X is in U Z N minus delta. Right, why is that? That's because uh, so remember U prime was the things that such a every geodesic this was greater than R. Uh, so but we know that if some geodesic is greater than uh, S, then slightly enlarging this uh, means that um, every geodesic is in there. And similarly here, uh, um, we can just subtract by this constant C from the previous lemma, and then there's, there's no big deal there. And then we get that this is the exact thing here. All right, so this is for each of us. So let's show that if, why is this? If n is greater than zero and y is in this neighborhood where every geodesic is is uh, has this Gromov product uh, limb for the Gromov product greater than n and x is in this neighborhood of y which satisfies the same thing then x is in the neighborhood of z with respect to n minus delta. Okay so let's go ahead and now prove 
this thing here. So what do we do? We'll go ahead and take, take geodesics, take geodesic pants, say alpha, beta, gamma, connecting the origin to x, y, and z respectively. All right, and what do we know? We know that the limit, the limit, uh, as n and m tend to infinity of gamma, gamma n beta m is greater than n. All right, so I took uh right so gamma represents z beta represents y and this is just saying that y lives in this space here so i in here so that that's there uh but what does that mean that means that well these are all paths coming from the origin so that means since the gromov product is greater than n so that means that the length of that tripod so the length of the tripod is at least n, which means in particular that if we plug in uh, capital N for the coefficients here, we have that then the distance between gamma n and beta n is less than delta because they map to the same point on the comparison tripod. All right, uh, similarly, we have that uh, if we take gamma and alpha, so that represents z and x. Uh, oh, so sorry, beta and alpha. Beta and alpha represents x and y. So we'll do this condition here. So x is in this neighborhood of y. So we have this similarly the distance from alpha n to beta n is less than delta for the same reason because x is in that neighborhood. Uh, but then we can combine these two facts and so by the triangle inequality, so we, we get therefore the distance between alpha n or gamma n and alpha n is less than two delta. Well, well, now we'll do an inequality like we did earlier, where we can say that therefore two, and now we take the Gromov product alpha m gamma n, O, and now we can say that this is, well, by the formula, this is exactly uh, m plus n minus the distance from alpha m gamma n. because the paths are all starting at the origin by construction. Uh, but now this we can say is greater than or equal to m plus n minus, and then n minus n plus distance alpha n gamma n plus n minus capital N. And then we just compute this and we see that this is um, what the uh, M's cancel ends uh, should uh, we get yeah the M's cancel the ends cancel so all that's left are two ends and then this which is two delta. So we get the whole thing is equal. Uh, okay, so sorry, I can't fit it all. So this is all equal to two n minus uh, plus two delta. 
but that exactly says that X is in this neighborhood here. So that finishes the proof. Right? The, this distance, well, twice this distance is greater than 2n plus 2 delta. So therefore, x has some representative which satisfies this. Okay. All right, so what good is this? Well, this is exactly the condition we need to say that these uh, form a neighborhood base, right? So the, as a consequence, we can define, so here's the definition. Uh, so we equip the closure, uh, so gamma bar with a topology by declaring a subset O in gamma bar to be open if and only if uh, for every z in the boundary of gamma intersect this set, uh, there exists some r greater than zero such that u z r is contained in O. So i.e. the sets u z r uh, are all neighborhoods of Z. Um, and yeah, so then of course, this defines, this gives you a definition of an open set. And then you have to check that uh, this actually defines the topology by showing that uh, unions of open sets are open uh, and showing that the intersection of finitely many open sets is again open. And these are all trivialities from the previous uh, lemma. So this is very easy. Uh, so this gives a uh, topology on gamma bar. And uh, maybe the thing to notice is that uh, note that gamma is uh, open and uh, dense in gamma bar. So you get this open dense subset uh, here. It's also easy to see that it's uh, Hausdorff. Uh, that again follows from this uh, lemma right here. It's pretty easy to see. So this is uh, and this topology is Hausdorff. So these are all things that are very easy to see from the previous lemma. Uh, so the next thing that I want to do is, uh, so to prove that this topology is compact, uh, but for to prove it's compact, we're going to need an extra assumption. In fact, it won't be compact in general. In fact, maybe we could take a, a slight break, a pause, and do an example, and that will give us some intuition. Uh, so one, our favorite example of a hyperbolic space, in fact, this is in some sense motivates much, much of the theory, uh, is that we can consider a tree. So how about we consider, uh, you know, so let's consider a tree. So we'll consider T a tree. Um, so for example, the Cayley graph, the natural Cayley graph of group on two generators with its uh, generating set A and B. All right, so this is our one of our favorite graphs. It's exactly this sort of thing here. And then a geodesic, uh, well it's a tree, so a geodesic is just any uh, pass we could take the origin to be there maybe, and then uh, any path you can think of as some, so the boundary, uh, we think of the boundary as some point, you know, as the points out here, and they're parameterized by paths, which 
we think of as converging to the point on the boundary, but they're represented by paths. And this case, of course, since it's a tree, uh, between any two points, there's a unique geodesic. And, uh, and there are, again, uh, between any two, any two infinite geodesics are going to be equivalent uh, unless, uh, you know, if and only if they're equal. So for here, the equivalence is the same as equal for uh, geodesics. Well, if we're assuming they all start at the origin. Um, and uh, yeah, and here the comparison tri and here the triangle itself is already a comparison tripod, so everything becomes fairly simple in this case. And in this case, it's pretty easy to see that the uh, boundary is compact uh, because if you think of uh, you know if you have like a net of infinite rays, well there are of infinite geodesics all coming from the origin. Well, from the origin, there are only four options of where it's going to leave. And so if you have any infinite collection of them, one direction is going to be represented infinitely often. And then once you go in that direction, there's only three more directions for the next step to go. And again, one of those directions have to happen infinitely often. And you can create in this way a whole path. So if you have, in fact, this is, uh, you might as well make this a theorem. Uh, so the theorem is that if, uh, the graph gamma satisfies the property that uh, balls are finite, that balls are finite, so then the boundary will be compact. Is compact. And, and the argument uh, for this is exactly the argument I, I was telling you. Uh, so it's no different than the argument for the tree. So we fix some origin and uh, suppose that we have some net xi uh, is a net uh, of points in the boundary. Uh, and then if we want to do with nets, actually in this case, that's maybe another remark is that in this case, it'll actually be separable. So maybe it's enough to check sequences. In fact, uh, well, no. So in the, yeah, I'll, I'll mention that. So in fact, the topology here, looks an origin. Uh, since balls are finite, you can write the whole thing as a union of finite balls. And so that says that the, uh, there's only gonna be, um, uh, continuum many paths. So this topology will be separable. So this, uh, the topology on this is separable. So to see that the boundary is compact, suffices to show that every sequence has a convergent subsequence. All right, so in general, topological space is compact if every net has some convergence of net. Here, here we can do, deal with sequences since it's separable. Uh, so let's go ahead and take Xn a sequence, uh, a sequence in the boundary. And then we'll do exactly what I said. So we'll, we'll represent, so we'll take 
uh, alpha n uh, geodesics from the origin such that alpha n plus is equal to xn. And then we can do exactly what I said. So we know that there are finitely many choices since the ball of radius one is finite, there are finitely many choices for alpha one. So since the ball of radius one at the origin is finite, uh, there exists there exists some point, uh, so there exists some point in the ball, some say uh, A1 in uh, the ball, some A1 distance from A1 to, to the origin to be one, such that A1 is equal to alpha one, uh, alpha N1 for infinitely many Ns. <laughs> Uh, so then this defines a subsequence, right? So for uh, a subsequence, maybe it's a better way to write it, for a subsequence alpha n, n sub k. Uh, but then we can do the same thing for the ball of radius two for the subsequence. Uh, there again. There exists A2 distance from A2 to A1 equal one, such that A2 is equal to alpha n k2 for infinitely many k. So then we can create another subsequence. And then we keep creating these subsequences. And what happens is that we eventually, in this way, construct mass. So in this way, we construct an infinite geodesic, a, uh, a n. And then by construction, uh, for any finite subpath of this AM, there will be some alpha which agrees with it. But that exactly says that if you take this whole sequence of alphas, they will converge to this geodesic. Uh, so this the infinite geodesic, and this is uh, clearly an accumulation point. of this set of alpha ends. All right, so that proves that it converges. So that finishes the proof of that. Yes, one, one question. We do need to be careful to not be going back with this. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this should be so such that it's a finite GDS. I should have been maybe been more careful such that uh, this infinite, well, I mean, I said for infinitely many Ks, which in particular means that it's part of a sequence of geodesics. Yeah, by construction, this, this really is a geodesic. But, all right, uh, because we've already ensured that before it is, and, and we aren't going back because the alpha Ks are also all, all geodesics. Uh, so one, maybe another example though, uh, of when this isn't, so we can consider, say, the free group with infinitely many generators. So this gives it uh, with its Cayley graph. Uh, so we can consider the tree uh, such that such that each vertex has infinitely, say, countably many. many uh, edges. Well, this is still a perfectly nice uh, hyperbolic space. It's a zero hyperbolic space. 
Uh, and so we can still define this uh, boundary uh, and we can still define this closure, but it will not be compact uh, in this topology. So then, so let's call it T. So then the boundary of T uh, is not compact. but it's still an interesting uh, topological space. And I don't want to ignore this, this space because we'll, we'll try to prove things about this or, or similar things um, later in the semester. So uh, while it's, you know, for the boundary to be compact, you, you do need this property that balls are finite, um, but uh, there are interesting hyperbolic spaces that, I mean, there's, there are spaces that will be interesting for us even when the boundary is not compact. So that's just don't ignore those completely. All right, are there any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, uh, do you assume that, uh, I, I, I thought that we are using the fact that when, when we are given a vertex and uh, infinite, um, so the, the element of delta gamma, there is, always a uh, geodesic uh, connecting these point, two points. Yes. But uh, don't, don't we need a local, uh, local finiteness to do that? No. Okay. No, the, so, for, so the only assumptions we're using, actually I think even in, in the beginning last week, I, I said we were not allowing multiple edges, but even that's fine. Uh, so the graph, uh, we're, we have a graph, uh, it's allowed to have multiple edges even, uh, but we're just assuming it's delta hyperbolic and we're assuming that it's connected. So being connected implies that between any two points, there is a geodesic. And that doesn't require any, uh, that balls are finite. Uh, so the boundary is just defined as this set of infinite equivalence classes of infinite geodesics. So that's, that's just how the boundary is defined. So by definition, if you have a point on the boundary, then there's a geodesic representing it. Yeah, but, uh, can we specify the uh, point of the beginning? The origin? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, the, the origin's fine. Uh, so the, the fact that uh, the, the equivalence class, the geodesics doesn't depend on the origin, right? Uh, the fact that if we defined, this is how we defined it, right? So beta n, uh, alpha m, oh, we wanted that the limit as n m into infinity was uh, infinite. This was our definition of the equivalence. And this is independent of O, and that doesn't require balls to be finite. Uh, that's just a triangle inequality. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, uh, when we are given a vertex and the uh, point in delta gamma, is there, is there always uh, a geodesic that begins from that oh, yes. specified yeah. vertex? I, I think I understand. So the question is, is that, uh, so we have some point in gamma, uh, some, some point in the boundary. So mm -hmm. alpha's in the boundary, and this is coming from some O, and now we have a different O prime. And we want to know if it's represented by, by this. Yeah, by the geodesic that begins from O prime. Yeah. And that's fine because we can just take uh, the distance from O prime to the path. So we just take the distance and so, so this is some alpha, so M, and we just take this, the distance between O prime and alpha. And then we create a new path right there. But then it's a geodesic. And it's a geodesic because we chose the point which is minimizes the di the distance, so you can't get there any quicker. Oh, I see. Mm. Okay, I, I will think about it more. Thank you. Yeah, so that that just uses the fact that um, the metric space is discrete. That doesn't use that balls are finite. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, great, we'll go ahead and stop here and then we'll uh, pick up on, on Wednesday.